Good afternoon. Good that we can be together again in this lunchtime devotion. Much of my sharing again will be uh, taken from commentaries gleaned from the NIV Study Bible, the NLT Life Application Study Bible Commentary, the message of one John from Bible Speaks Today, and also from Bible God, uh, from GodQuestion.org. Well, we continue on first letter of John. So far, we have been introduced to Christian conduct is meant to be marked by obedience in the truth. Christians are called to live like Christ. The stark differences between those who truly have fellowship with Christ as opposed to those who are in darkness and the importance of being a child of God and living accordingly. Yesterday, the LTD study stopped at chapter 3 verse 10. The verse that said that anyone who lives righteously and love fellow believers belong to God. Today, the verses that we will be touching on from chapter 3 verse 11 to chapter 4 verse 6 are all action-packed verses. The readers are called to action. We are to love, to work out deeds of love and to test. Now, let us look at what the, uh, the verses have to say from uh, chapter 3, verse 11 to 18. Starting from verse 11, this is the message that you have heard from the beginning. We should love one another. We must not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and killed his brother. And what, why did he kill his, him? Because Cain had been doing what was evil and his brother had been doing, doing what was righteous. So don't be surprised, dear brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. Verse 14, if we love our Christian brothers and sisters, it proves that we have passed from death to life. But a person who has no love is still death. Anyone who hates another brother or sister is really a murderer at heart. And you know that murderers don't have eternal life within them. Verse 16, we know what real love is because Jesus gave us, gave up his life for us. We, so we also ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. If someone has enough money to live well and sees a brother or sister in need, but shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? Dear Children, let us not merely say that we love each other. Let us show the truth by our action. The catchword in verse 11 to 18 is love. John, the apostle of love's favorite uh, subject. In verse 11, John reminded his readers that we should love one another. It was Jesus who first gave the commandment to love each other in uh, the book of John, chapter 13, verses 34 to 35, and uh, chapter 15, verses 12 to 17. Now our verse 12 says that our love should be that of what Jesus did, not like Cain. Our love should be like that of what Jesus said in John, chapter 15, first, uh, verses 12 and 13. Love in the same way I have loved you. Lay down one's life. Verses 14, 16, and 17 says, Do what I command. Go and produce lasting fruits. Love each other. It says to act out the love. Just do it. Show it in our lives. Cain's love is a misplaced love. It is primarily a love of self, which gives opportunity for jealousy, resentment, arousing hate, leading to murder. Cain allowed the sin or evil nature in him, which the, the scripture says is in all of us to overcome his feelings. This also could indicate that Cain is lacking in fellowship with God. This is also true in our own lives. self centeredness leads to a distancing from a fellowship with God and all sorts of thoughts that we are not that are not rightful coming to us. So what is love? It can be a challenging 
uh, effort to define love at the level of how a person experiences it. The Greek word translated as love in English are eros, filio, storch, agape. Unconditional love, agape. Unconditional self-sacrificial love, putting others first, is what is meant in verse 11. So what is love in the Bible? It is not a matter of emotion of the heart. It is a commitment and the will of the mind and spirit. First Corinthians chapter 13 verses 4 to 8 lists love's characteristics. These are being patient and kind. Does not envy, boast, or dishonor others. Not proud, not self-seeking, not easily angered, does not keep a record of wrongs, and does not delight in evil. Rather, love rejoices with the truth, always protects, trusts, hopes, and perseveres. Love never fails. Love lasts forever. First Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13 says, of, of God's gift of faith, hope, and love, the greatest is love. God's love is best seen in the sacrifice of Christ in our, on our behalf. And God's love does not require us to be worthy to receive it. His love is truly benevolent, gracious. God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It's recorded in Romans chapter 5, verse 8. In, chapter, in John chapter 21, verses 15 to 17, Jesus asked Peter to, first in verse 15 and 16, to agape him. In verse 17, to filio him. Peter must possess such love in order that Peter can be prepared and will be able to feed, as Jesus said, the lamb, to care, to care for the sheep and to feed the sheep that Christ will be giving to them. The hallmark of our belonging to Christ is love, agape love. Loving fellow believing brothers and sisters in Christ and extending it to our enemies. Our enemies means those who do not understand us, do not understand our belief system, those who ridicule us, those who persecute us in all ways, even to the extent of trying to take our lives. This is, uh, uh, we, can, we have reference to Matthew chapter 5, verse 45, 43 to 48, and Luke chapter 6, verses 27 to 26. To show God's love can have consequences. One may encounter the world's evil hate of goodness. So, John uh, reminds his uh, readers to expect ridicules and unpleasantness, even to being condemned by those who are impacted negatively by our showing of righteous response. But we are comforted by Jesus' word in Matthew uh, chapter 5, verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Then in verse 14, John says, Love proves that we have passed from death to life. The Greek, root, the Greek root word translated here as love is agape. Those who show this kind of love give strong evidence that we are true believers and in fellowship with Christ and have moved from the realm of the world, which is spiritual death, to the realm of God, which is eternal life. The Bible says that we are to love others the way that God loves us. We are to love the family of God, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 17. We are to love our enemies, that is, we are to actively seek the best for them, Matthew chapter, six, verse four, uh, chapter 5, verse 44. Husbands are to love their wives as Christ loves the church, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. And as we show benevolent, selfless love, we reflect God's love to a lost and dying world. We love because God first loved us. First John chapter 4, verse 19. So love for our brothers and sisters in Christ is an indispensable mark 
of genuine Christianity or belief in Christ. Faith and love belong together throughout in the New Testament. So a reflection, as a Christian, how do I react to my brothers and sisters in God's family? Sometimes conflict still exists. So how do I handle it? God's will or my will? Let's continue, verse 15. John echoes Jesus' teaching in Matthew chapter 5, verse 21 to 22 in verse 15, that whoever hates another person is a murderer at heart. So think well of our fellow brothers. Verse 16 to 20 says about love. Real love is love in action. Agape love produces selfless sacrificial giving. The greatest act of love is giving oneself to others. This giving oneself does not necessarily mean dying for someone. It is about serving others with no thoughts of living or receiving anything in return. It is about doing work for the well-being of others who is in no position or able to repay. It is about releasing our time, possession, talents, expertise, etc. to meet the needs of those in a wanting situation. If we are honest, this is sometimes very difficult, a very difficult call. Verse 17 to 18 says, and give an example of how to give up our lives for others. For others. It is to help those in need. James has a similar teaching in James chapter 2, verse 14 to 17. Some questions to ourselves. How clearly are, we, are our actions in our day-to-day -day behavior showing, so, showing we really love one another? Am I as generous as I should be with my money, possession, and time? On reflection, I'm truly privileged to be in a congregation that is truly committed to putting their hands to the plow and putting practice into teachings in the respect of love. Just to mention a few of the acts of love seen in the congregation which I am privileged to be in. There is hospital visitation, there is home visitation, tuition to the needy community in and around the area of the church, financial support where needed most, and then there is an annual collection solely for the support of mission and gospel work and provision of needs for mission partners, and that is a food bank for the needy. Then there's arrangement for, in the in recent times, uh, arrangement for necessary vaccination against COVID infection for undocumented people. And there's this involvement by members in the provision of service and, and quarantine ve venue uh, for COVID patients through approved organizations. And there is much spiritual and in-person support for those impacted by the loss of loved ones in the COVID pandemic. But in the recent months, the most significant is the mobilization of a large groceries online order team, codenamed Good, filled by members of the congregation to manage and carry out a smooth and orderly online order of essential food supply regularly to more than 200 families who run short of means to provide for themselves until they are able to stand on their own two feet. A large percentage of these families are non-believers yet. This, I see, is love in action. Praise the Lord. Continuing with our study of the letter of John, verse 19 to 24 says, verse 19, our action will show that we belong to the truth. So we will be confident when we stand before God. Even if we feel guilty, God is greater than our feelings and he knows everything. So dear friends, if we don't feel guilty, we come to God with all confidence and we will receive from him whatever we ask because we obey him 
and do the things that please him. Verse 23 say, and this is his commandment. We must believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. Those who obey God's commandments remain in fellowship with him and he with us. And we know he lives in us because the spirit gave us life, gave us life in us. So after touching on love, John reminds and encourages his readers that obedience is what is, pleases God. We need not be burdened by thoughts of not doing enough. John in the verse 19 to 20 tells that God knows us through and through. Our deeds of love show that we belong to the truth, belong to God. When we did our best and had given and served in humility, there is no too little in God's eyes. We reminded the widow's might, the two small coins, you know, is huge in God's perspective. God knows our true motive and our capacity. Capacity. He will not condemn us. Romans chapter 8, verse 1 says so. The Holy Spirit is that the Holy Spirit that is in us is greater than our heart and knows everything. When we act in love, it is proof that we are abiding in the life that Christ wants us to do. John 10:10. 10, 10 and acted accordingly to his will. We can approach God if we have done so with confidence and his ears are open to us. Verse 21 to 22 says, if we have been obedient to love and acted, our conscience is clear. We can come to God without fear, confidence that our request will be heard. God re John reaffirms Jesus' promise that whatever we ask for, will be given to us. Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. We will receive if we obey and do what pleases him because we will then be asking in line with God's will. Nonetheless, this does not mean that we can have anything we ask, like instant riches. If we are truly seeking God's will, there are some requests that we will not make. Verse 23 continues to say that we are to believe in the name. All throughout scriptures, the name of a person is significant and stands for who he is, his character. Verse 23 calls readers to believe in the name of God's Son, Jesus Christ, and in his words, and to become more like him by united with him and to love one another. Jesus has said that first and foremost, we are to believe in his name. In Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 to 9 says that this is a requirement for salvation. John, 14, chapter, uh, John chapter 14, verse 12 to 14 says that it is also necessary for prayer, prayers to be effective. To love one another just as he has commanded us is a reminder of Jesus' command recorded in John, Jesus' commandment recorded in John chapter 13, verse 34, as well as in John chapter 15, verse 12, John chapter 15, verse 17, and Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 to 40. This love, loving others, is not new ideas or something John has come up to include after many years of his walk with Christ. This is a fundamental teaching of Jesus, something which was part of the faith from the very beginning. John also referred to this in verse 11, chapter three. Verse 24 says that the mutual relationship, living in Christ as he lives in us, shows itself in Christians who keep these three essential commands. Believe in Christ, love the brothers and sisters, and live normally, morally upright lives by obeying his command. The influence of Holy Spirit in a person's life is proof that a person has been saved. Since we can sin, 
and at times uh, do not abide in God's will, a lack of this influence of the Holy Spirit is all, not always a sign of an unbeliever. The warning in this verse is that those who show no signs at all of the influence of the Spirit fail to give any evidence that they are part of God's family. The evidence of the influence of Holy Spirit in a person's life becomes a powerful test for determining whether one is a true believer, for discerning whether false teachers, when John warns of false teaching in the following chapter 4, verses 1 to 6. So our conduct verifies God's uh, the Holy Spirit is present. Some reflections here. We are never perfect in our obedience. There are many remnants of our always old way, ways of the life in us, even in the most holy of Christians. Occasional slack in our walk does not put us out of God's tent and fellowship with him. When the Holy Spirit and conscience convict us and we confess and ask God for forgiveness, He is faithful and just and forgive and cleanse us. John says so in 1 John, in this letter, chapter 1, verse 9. The evidence, the evidence of activity of the Holy Spirit in our life is a refu irrefutable proof that we have been born of God and that we have crossed over from death to life. Now we have come to the portion, chapter, verse, chapter 4, verse six, 1 to 6, about false teaching and false teachers. In these chapter, uh, verses in chapter 4, 1 to 6, verses 1 to 6, John teaches his, his readers on how to discern false prophets. 1 to 6 reads thus, Dear friends, do not believe anyone who claims to speak by the Spirit. You must test them to see if the Spirit they, come, they have come comes from God, for there are many false prophets in the world. This is how we know if they have the Spirit of God. If a person claiming to be a prophet acknowledges that Jesus Christ comes in the real body, that person has the Spirit of God. But if someone claims to be a prophet and does not acknowledge the truth about Jesus, that person is not from God. Such a person has the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard is coming into the world, as indeed is already here. But you belong to God, my dear children. You have already won a victory over those people, because the spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit who lives in the world. Those people belong to this world, so they speak from the world's viewpoint, and the world listens to them. But we belong to God, and those who know God listen to us. If we do not belong to God, they do not listen to us. If they do not belong to God, they do not listen to us. That is how we know if someone has the spirit of truth or the spirit of deception. So in 1 John chapter 4, verse 1 to 16, John refers again to what he had written about in chapter 2, verses 18 to 29. False teachers, false prophets, and false teachings. He again warned his readers not to blindly accept all spiritual claims and teachings that are different from the gospel that were first taught to them when they believed and accepted Christ. And how to discern false teachers and prophets and those who want to lead to astray. I'm quoting chapter 2, verse 26. Those who deny Christ, his humanity, or who reject the basis of the gospel, the basics of the gospel, cannot be trusted. They are antichrist, John says. In John, uh, in verse 1 to 2, the words, Do not believe anyone who claims to speak, to speak by the Spirit. You must test them to see 
if the spirit they have come from, if the spirit they have comes from God. Means that we shouldn't believe everything we hear just because someone claims it is a message from God. John says to test them. The term spirit used here refers to the attitude and approach of the particular teacher, his character, and his day-to-day -day behavior. There are many ways to test teachers to see if the message is true, truly from God. One is to check if their words match what God say in the scriptures for the readers of John's letter, the OT. There's no new T yet, New Testament, I mean. Maybe some have heard about the epistles. Eh? Now we have the various translation of the Bible to refer to. Other tests that we can use is, other tests we can put to the teachers is their commitment to the body of believers, their lifestyle, and the fruit of their ministries. This we can refer to what John says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 19, 1 John chapter 3, verses 23 to 24, and 1 John later, verse, chapter 4, verse 6. The most important test of all, says John, is what they believe about Christ. Do they accept the humanity of Jesus and teach that Jesus is fully God and fully man? Do they accept the message of Christ, his life, his sacrifices on the cross, his sacrifice on the cross, and his resurrection? A reflection. Our world is filled with voices claiming to speak for God. We should give this test to what we hear and to them we see to see if they are, uh, they are really uh, speakers from God. In verse 3, the Antichrist is mentioned. This Antichrist will be a person who represents all that is evil, and he will be readily received by an evil world. He is the one more fully described in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 to 12. In Revelation chapter 13, here the spirit of Antichrist refers to the false teachers who pretend to be followers of Christ and taught a different message about Christ and those who lure weak believers away from Christ. Second Timothy chapter 3 verse 5 says that the teachers, these false teachers promotes a phony godliness which exists apart from the biblical Jesus. After speaking about the false teachers and false teaching in the verse 1 to 3, John now offers reassurance to his readers. He calls them, my dear children, speaking as a father of a family, a father who knows the hard thoughts and struggles of his own children. The believers, especially those new believers who had just come to Christ, could be easily frightened, weighed down and overwhelmed by thought as to whether they could handle the onslaught of these false teachers, false teachers and their followers and remain standing steadfast in their walk with and grow in the knowledge of the Lord. He offers three words of comfort concerning their lives. First, John said that you belong to God. In other words, John sees them as true believers in whom God lives. They are able to overcome. Second, he said that since these believers, by coming into Christ, have already won the victory over this Antichrist. John uses the concept of being victorious, overcoming, in five other times in this letter. Believers have overcome the evil one and have overcome the world by rejecting the evil one, by rejecting the world and accepting Christ. Third, John reminds the reader that being in Christ and Christ in them 
the power of Christ who lives in the believer is greater than the power of the world. The Holy Spirit living in the Christian is far stronger than any attack by the Spirit that is against Christ. The Holy Spirit and the Word that is in each believer will anoint him with wisdom and discernment to know the truth. The cross and the empty tomb have proven God's superior power over all his enemies. This power is available in, to each child of God as we remain in him and draw upon his limit, limitless resources. In the last word of today's last verse of today's study, verse 6, John explained to the readers and also to us that false teachers are popular with the world because, like the false prophets of the Old Testament, they tell people what they want to hear. John warns that Christians who faithfully teach God's word will not win any popularity contest in the world. People don't want to hear their sins denounced. They don't want to listen to, listen to demands that they change their behavior. The words, that is how we know if someone has the spirit of truth or spirit of deception, holds true even today. So some reflection. As all of us present day children of God, Acts chapter 2, 20, verse 27 says that we have all that God wants you to know available to, us, available to us in the Bible. So we have no excuse for remaining ignorant of theology and doctrine. Two, we should be able to test and discern and be less likely to be taken in by smooth talkers and false prophets as we work hard so we can present yourself to God and receive his approval, says 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. And when we know God's word, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14 says, we will no longer be immature like children. We, don't, we won't be tossed and blown up about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. Agreement with the scripture is the ultimate test of what is true and acceptable interpretation. So what is the take home part, the take home points for today's reading? One, we Christians are to love one another, also to love our neighbors. Two, Love is to be translated into action. Three, discern, soft, soft, uh, discern false teachers and reject teachings that are against the truth. Have I been faithful in these areas? Some thoughts. Huh? Key verses, 1 John 3, 11. This is the message you have heard from the beginning. We should love one another. 1 John 3 verse 12, uh, verse 14. If we love our Christian brothers and sisters, we prove that we have passed from death to life. 1 John 4 4. But you belong to God. You have already won a victory. The spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit who lives in the world. Some reflection taken from the BWJ and some useful prayers. Lord, I cannot forgive because he, she has hurt me so deeply. But because you want me to love, so in obedience, I release forgiveness to him or her. Now, Lord, I obey, I obey your command to love him. Please create opportunities for me to show love to him or another. This is a prayer if we are struggling with forgiveness and love. Some thoughts, when was the last time the Spirit urged you to pray for those who have harmed and wantonly used you? So those are the thoughts of today.